Hi, good day. This is Mr. Shadrach with the Shadrach Safety Institute. Coming at you with another Nibosh tutorial on our SAPER question session. This uh, lesson is for the National General Certificate students and it is in line with your syllabus here. Um, 3.4 Assessing Risk. Right now, for those of us who have um, the newer textbooks, you could find this in Chapter 3, of course. And uh, those would have been there on the first class, the one that uh, is from you know 8 to 10, 30, that one you'll find this respective part of the syllabus um, in chapter four. Now, again, the, um, the clock has started ticking there. So, I mean, we, we need to get into this. Now, it's quite a lot. Um, so again, what I'll try to do is hold this down to half an hour anyway, just about 20 minutes into the lesson. What I'll do, I would stop and look at a past paper. Right, so we would not be able to look at all of these here, but we may be able to look at some. So I guess we could look at meaning of hazards, risk. We could leave risk profiling for another session because this is a totally different concept to a risk assessment. So we can tie meaning of hazards, risk into risk assessment. Uh, we can go into the purpose of a risk assessment and perhaps the five steps of doing um, a risk assessment, right? So you may have had these um, PowerPoints emailed to you already. Um, the first class would have had it from before. The second class, they would have probably sent it on Sunday. If by chance you didn't get it, just let me know. And again, give me um, a couple of days to have those sent out to you all anyway. Right, let's go straight into this one. So we're gonna be looking at the meaning of the term hazards risk. Um, we'll be going into the purpose of a risk assessment, suitable and sufficient, and the steps to a risk assessment. So ideally here, the first bullet point of 3.4, uh, the third and perhaps the fourth, and we probably wanna end it just around here for the first half an hour anyway, right? Let's go into this lesson now. Right, so to get this to go again for you all. Um, so we have, um, right, so to facilitate meeting towards the following teams, and we just saw this on the syllabus, the uh, meeting every term hazards and risks, the legal requirement, right? So let's go into this. So um, the revision for this, the would have been on safety culture, the previous lesson that we would have, you know, completed aims and objectives. So I guess one of the first things to know here um, is why we need to do a risk assessment. So this is um, on some of the other slides, but I believe a simple answer why we need to do a risk assessment is that it is a legal requirement. So you can find some of this on um, Regulation Street of the Management of Health and Safety Regulations, 1999. Um, that require the employer to undertake a suitable and sufficient risk assessment. So this is something to learn by heart, just in case you are unfamiliar with this law. This is a regulation that is a spin-off of the um, traditional HSW Act 1974. So these are normally called regulations and they are made under the HSW Act. Um, doing a risk assessment is, in, is really implied in the HSW Act, meaning that the, the phrase risk assessment wasn't really taught about as yet. And um, even if it was taught about it, it really didn't, you know, make it into the law books as yet. It took, you know, typically till about till 1999 for risk assessments to be a common household name then. So to really update the HSW Act, what would have been that would have been a regulations is really a way to update the Act. And then typically regulations three requires that the employer undertake what is called a suitable and a sufficient risk assessment. Now, these two words here have a meaning, we'll get to that in a bit, but for now, it's enough to know that the, 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 the reason or the legal reason for doing a risk assessment is found within regulations three of the Management of Health and Safety and Work Regulations, 1999. Now, some of this here too would have been on lesson um, one, what is meant by the term hazard? Most of you may know that already. What is meant by the term risk and the risk 
formula. Just in case you don't know it, please learn it by heart. So a hazard is the potential to cause harm, can include articles, substances, plant or machine, method of work, the working environment, and other aspects of work organization. So most people know the first piece of it, the potential to cause harm. Um, you just have to add to this a bit though that um, a hazard could be um, classed into different categories as well. For example, you could have like um, mechanical hazards um, and then those would include things like entanglement, crushing, shearing, friction, abrasion. Um, you have different categories of hazard. You have chemical as a category of hazards, physical is a category of hazards, biological. So you can think of these anyway, um, that it is a potential to cause harm, but it, it could be grouped as a category as well. So what is the risk? Risk is the likelihood of what you said going to happen, right? For example, let's say crushing actually going to happen, right? And then if it does happen, what is the consequences or the severity of someone being crushed? So you put that together, you're going to get risk is the likelihood of harm occurring and its severity. Um, the likelihood of potential harm from the hazard being realized, and there is a formula for this, risk is equal to likelihood times the severity. For those um, who may be working anyway, and those who may have uh, seen this elsewhere, um, there is another formula, which is one that they will just substitute the words likelihood for probability. It really means the same thing, and then you have um, consequences for severity. So if you see, I guess those of us who are working, those who may have done other courses, you see the formula being probability by consequences. Nothing is wrong with that. It's just another way of seeing the same thing as likelihood times the um, severity. Right? So what is a risk assessment? Um, it's the process of identifying preventative and protective measures. And it can probably add the further preventative and protective measures by first evaluating the risk arising from the hazard, taking into account the adequacy of any existing controls. And most of the times, when you consider the risk, it will not be 100% adequate. And that's why you have to put in further preventative and protective measures. So therefore, a risk assessment is the process of identifying those further protective measures by first looking at the risk see what they are doing now, which is the current, right? Uh, existing controls. And then if they are not sufficient, which most of the time they are not, then you have to decide to put in further controls and the further controls will determine if the risk is now acceptable or not acceptable. Um, hopefully you got that there, but if not, you can just learn it there. The process of identifying further controls by considering the risk and the controls that are present for those. Most of the time, if the risk is high, it means if the present controls are not sufficient or the existing controls are not sufficient. So therefore, you have to put in further controls in order to make the risk acceptable, right? Um, a nice definition though, um, just for exam though, um, it, it has not come for exam before, right? Um, to say to define a risk assessment has not come for the exam. I mean, we have, we have seen hazards and risk, but we have not seen risk assessments, right? So the objective of a risk assessment to determine the measures required by the organization to comply with relevant health and safety legislation to ensure the risk is acceptable Right? I mean, you, you wouldn't do a risk assessment and then something turns out to be high and then you say that is acceptable, right? It would be unacceptable. To fulfill a moral duty of care to employees, prevention of workplace accidents, reduce the direct and indirect costs associated with an accident. So this is um, one of the terms I was mentioning before that when the law regulations tree said the employer needed to do a risk assessment, it didn't just say a risk assessment. It, it said suitable and sufficient. And what you need to know is that these words have, um, you know, like uh, a meaning behind them anyway. And um, just, I guess just explain it. What it really means is that um, the risk assessment then will have to be tailored to 
the employee. The risk assessment will have to be tweaked then to the employee. You see, if you don't do that, then it would not be suitable for everyone. For example, a risk assessment for an average worker may not be suitable for a pregnant employee. A risk assessment for an average uh, employee may not be suitable for somebody that is differently able. So when the law said do a risk assessment, it didn't just say do a risk assessment and then what is good you know, for one is good for all, but it said make sure it is suitable and sufficient. You can take up sufficient as for example that um, a company may have done a risk assessment, but it may have been, let's say, five years old, or I mean, God forbid, 10 years old. Um, if it is 10 years old, then it is no longer sufficient, you know, in 2020. So that is the, the meaning behind suitable and sufficient, that when the employer do their risk assessment, that it is done with some consideration in mind then, that they do have to consider the people, the process, and maybe the work environment uh, failure to do so would mean that the risk assessment is no longer suitable and sufficient. So risk assessment should identify all foreseeable risk. The level of detail should be proportionate to the risk. What that means is that the higher the level of risk, the more controls you need to put in place. You must record all significant findings. The level of risk should determine the degree of sophistication in the risk assessment. Employers self-employed should use appropriate information sources to help them identify risk. The risk assessment should be appropriate to the nature of the work and should identify the period of time for which it is to remain valid, right? So typically the I think in Trinidad, the OSHA specifies one year. Um, in the UK, which is where this course would have come from, they actually did not really say one year. Um, what they said though, to make it sufficient, you need to review it as often as is needed, right? So the UK never would have mentioned a time frame as the, as the one year, but really, you know, as often as is needed anyway, right? So if you've got that idea, what is meant by the term suitable and sufficient? Um, I have seen this question before, you know, which is... Um, to identify the criteria for suitable and sufficient. Now, if they were to ask that, what I did with this, I mean, a good way of looking at the criteria um, is to learn these words here, um, like the bigger words, right? So a criteria is that the risk assessment should identify all foreseeable risk. So foreseeability is a criteria. The risk assessment, uh, the level of detail should be proportionate to the risk. So proportionate is a criteria. Uh, it should be appropriate to the nature of their work. So then this is also a criteria. Um, when this came, and again, this is on the older paper, as there is no new paper at the moment, um, they would have asked for four of the criteria, right? So I guess you could pull out four from there. Um, the criteria so suitable and sufficient. At the same time, too, if you understood the explanation, you can just see, as how I said it, that it must be suitable for different people, different tasks, right? Um, uh, the, the worker that is differently able, someone that is pregnant, etc. A failure to do so, it means that it, that it is not suitable, nor is it sufficient. All right, um, so uh, the page here, of course, page 103, page 107, is more reflective of the older textbook. I think the um, second class, you can find it just around page 30 something of your textbook anyway. All you have to do is look at the table of contents and, and, and I guess you'll get it. So risk assessment um, can be qualitative in words such as saying high, medium and low. And uh, some of that is covered at the NIBOR certificate level. And it can be quantitative using a simple risk matrix to determine the calculation that's more suitable for students on the diploma level. But I mean, some of it is in both books anyway. If you look at both books, you'll see that they would have used numbers one, two, three, some books one, two, three, four, five anyway. And that's a way of judging risk. So then one will be low, um, you know, three will be medium, five will be high, right? And what they do, I'll try to show you one of this lesson doesn't permit it. What they do, they would normally take the risk formula likelihood by consequences and each side is out of five, right? So then you multiply, you know, um, one group of five by another group of fives. 
and then you end up with a number. So if one, let's say the likelihood is three out of five, so that's three. And uh, let, me, let me see if I can get that for you here now. Um, uh, right, so. Right, I was saying, yeah. So if, um, if you look at the risk formula here, like in terms of risk, it is going to be, um, you know, likelihood times uh, severity. Each side is typically out of five. So this is one here, ranging um, to five, and then this side is also one here to five, all right? So then if you see then, um, not to show what happened there, let me go back. Um, right, I guess I could erase that, I guess. Right, so, um, yes, yeah. so if you see that, uh, that's actually not what I'm looking for there, I guess it's pretty new to me as well. Let me see if I can get this back, you know. Right, I guess we get the idea, right? I'm not quite sure which one is the icon there for that. Let me see if I can get that sheet back. Right, it actually didn't change the highlighter, right? No, that didn't do it either, right? Um, I'm just come out of this, so I, I guess I get the idea. This is one to five, this is one to five. So then this would have been, let's say this is three. And this one would have been uh, five. This is three by five will give you 15. If I could get back the daily mark, I'll get it back for you in a bit, right? Let me just um, go back to the, um, to the PowerPoint, right? So that, that, that is the idea, though, that, um, that if it's, uh, if it's um, three by five, 15, you know, um, that gives you an idea of what the risk is. I do have some on the lessons, so I'll try to get it for you, right? Um, so risk assessments can be qualitative, quantitative in terms of the numbers I was trying to show you there, semi-quantitative, in which a combination of words and numbers are used. And this is actually more for the certificate students, right? Just so that you know and not get too confused here. Um, the quantitative here, right, that I said is meant for the diploma level, is not just simple numbers as what you'd have seen me trying to do there with the three and five, right? There are some advanced risk assessment calculations in which um, we're able to use up to decimal points, 0 0.866, right? 0 0.566 and stuff like that. So typically at the certificate level, we would use qualitative and semi-quantitative. And truly, the quantitative methods um, is really meant for the advanced levels anyway. Um, so risk assessors, who can do a risk assessment? Um, the person must be competent, skilled, experienced with both practical and theoretical knowledge. Teams can include HSE manager or professional, and HSE professional, they're meaning somebody with a degree, supervisor, someone familiar with work activities and location of work, safety representative, specialist, if needed for non-routine activities. So the idea though is that the person here um, have to be, uh, at least one of them have to be, um, seem to be competent and competent, meaning that they have the skill, the experience, practical and theoretical knowledge, right? So um, typically once you are finished with this course, you can be seen to be competent. Once you're finished with the level three, you can be qualified then um, in the eyes of the law, the OSHA here in Trinidad as well, to be someone that is competent to do a risk assessment. Um, just, for, I guess, for the people who, who know what I'm talking about here, that, that means though, that your name can go on a risk assessment sheet, uh, typically on the assessment sheet, they will have the name of the assessor. So your name can go on it. And if your name is on it, there is a certain um, accountability that comes with it. If someone was to be injured and uh, it was, let's say, a court matter would, would have been coming out of that, um, you know, you can, I mean, that document you'd have filled out could actually stand up in court as well, right? So that, that is all about skill and experience, etc. cetera. Right? Um, let's go again. So... I was trying to use these numbers before. So, you know, like it could be one, two, three, four, five, severity, one, two, three, four, five on both sides. You put them together and you end up with a number. I do have one worked out 
um, but I'm looking at the time, so we might be able to get it. But if you have the PowerPoint, if not, this lesson will be the following lesson, right? So some of the requirements, um, we mentioned the law, the regulations, three of the management of health and safety book regulation, 1999. And um, you can have a read of this. I'll just break it down for you that the employer must make a suitable and sufficient risk assessment that his employee and non-employees, self-employed persons need to do the same. The employer must review the risk assessment. The employer um, shall not employ a young person unless he had made a review of the risk assessment and that he would make it suitable and sufficient for the young person. And where the employee employs five or more employees, he shall record all significant findings in any group of his employees identified by it as being especially at risk. Right? Um, uh, in making a review in the assessment, an employer who employs or is to employ a young person shall take particular account of you know, the inexperience of a young worker, the fitting out of the workstation, the nature, degree, and duration of exposure to physical, biological, and chemical agents as a young person may be more susceptible, the form, range, and use of work equipment, and the way it is handled. Um, again, uh, a young person may use a piece of work equipment in a haphazard way then, as opposed to a skilled worker. So the employee needs to consider that in the risk assessment. Um, the organization of processes and activities, the extent of the health and safety training provided or to be provided to the young person and the risk of agents or processes listed in Annex to the Council Directive 94-33 EC-13 on the protection of young people at risk. And this is all about really, um, let's say, uh, physical agents. And some of these, there could be noise and vibration and stuff. What is the effect on the young person, right? Um, the employer needs to consider new and expectant mothers, and this is under Regulation 16 of the management regs. Um, so you need to consider uh, what to do if someone is in a new or an expectant mother. They need to try to avoid, to ensure, you know, the risk to the employee. Uh, you know, they need to change the work activity, reduce the working hours, if they cannot do that, what the latter line says is that what they need to do is suspend the work, right? The employee is to be given full pay if it is not reasonable for the employer to remove the risk. Um, 17 talks about um, 17 and 18. Again, the risk to uh, new or expected mothers, once you submit a medical certificate, they have to do the risk assessment right, or make it suitable and sufficient for you. And Regulation 19 talks about um, young persons. So again, you found there 16, 17, 18, 19, more or less spoke about doing a suitable and sufficient risk assessment for um, new and expectant mothers, young persons. And again, why we need to do it, it's all here. Um, young persons uh, may be inexperienced or unaware. Uh, something may be beyond their physical ability, but they believe that they can move it as I said before in the annex, um, the 94 to the 3 EC would have had in it, you know, some of the things young persons could be susceptible to, toxins, carcinogens, radiation, noise, vibration, et cetera, right? So you can have a read of this and uh, let's go to the end of it. Must consider young persons as well as people who work alone. Must consider disabled workers under the Equality Act 2010. Employers cannot discriminate must consider expectant and nursing mothers, right? So um, all of that is good stuff. I think that all of that falls within the idea of doing a suitable and sufficient risk assessment, right? So um, looking at the time there um, again. So again, this is now a big part for you to learn uh, for those of us who know about risk assessments. So if we could review a little bit here, you needed to know a definition for hazard risk. Um, not too much risk assessment, but you can know and then the whole concept of suitable and sufficient and what that means and who really requires a suitable and sufficient risk assessment. Um, you know, nursing mothers, expectant mothers, young persons, disabled persons. So that's about four days, right? So um, here we have uh, something, again, that is noteworthy for exam. Now, these are the steps in doing a risk assessment. Uh, again, if you don't know it, you'll find these on both books anyway. I do have the first um, the first class book, sorry, the second set of students book, um, this one anyway, right? And so um, I think um, this is, of course, taking some extra time, right? But um, 
But I guess if you want to have a look at this, this is on uh, page 32 here. You can see that, right? Uh, page 32, it may be upside down, I guess, of um, this book. You'll have your risk assessment, right? And um, those of us in the first class will get it in chapter four. I, I, it may be just a writing page 101 around there in the first textbook. Um, nonetheless, though, these are the steps in doing a risk assessment. You have to learn them by heart, right? Um, so it, it is really from a document in the UK. It's from a document that they refer to as um, INDG 163. Um, and we just kind of slow that down. Not that you have to know this, but the INDG stands for, the IND stands for industrial, the G stands for guidance. So these are the steps taken for um, INDG or the Industrial Guidance 163 in doing a risk assessment. So the steps are, the five steps, identify the hazard, decide who may be harmed and how, evaluate risk to decide if precautions are adequate or not. And as we mentioned before with the formula, this one here is actually the formula, the process of evaluating the risk likelihood by um, consequences, right? So um, record your findings, um, review your findings, et cetera, right? Um, so you could probably annotate this a bit, right? Yeah, so this is actually, the, this is the risk formula here. This is the formula that would have been uh, risk is equal to um, likelihood times the um, severity anyway, right? Record your findings, uh, review your findings, and um, what we can probably focus on is maybe just the first, three pieces of this study because when I say the first three pieces of it is that all of these you can go into them, right? This, this is what the approach is anyway. For example, when they say identify the hazard, right? They can ask, well, how do you identify the hazard, right? How do you, how, how do you identify the hazard? The answers for this is endless. Now, so it's on the slide, but some ways of getting the hazards is by taking a walk, right? What we call a walk through or walk down doing an inspection, right? Those are, way of, those are ways of identifying the hazard. Um, looking at complaints from employees, employees may be complaining that they are feeling unwell, uh, the noise is getting to them, all of those are ways. So employee complaints is a way of identifying the hazards. Um, the list is endless, like I said, I can't, you know, dig in even, if I dig in, I wouldn't finish, right? So you look at things like MSDS sheets, you look at things like past risk assessment, auditors reports right um notices from the inspectors all of those would have identified hazards clients customers right all of those would have been ways of identifying hazards so one of the things to learn here is that you have to learn this um you have to learn this um as the five steps right as saying identify the hazard who could be harmed evaluate the risk record review etc so that's one way, but another way of them, you know, knowing that you know the steps is to go into it. So each one of these uh, may not be each one, but most of these you can actually get eight marks again in that they can ask you what is eight ways of identifying the hazards, determine who may be harmed and how they normally like to ask three. Um, you can probably ask you a brief thing on a risk assessment. What is hazard? What is risk? Record your findings. They can ask um, what is eight items to record in a risk assessment. And I'll leave that for another lesson because the time is quickly um, going. Right? I think I have to click this one back, right? Yeah. All right. So, um, should have been able to get there. Right, um, hopefully that didn't stick the whole program there. Right, so methods of identifying hazard. Okay, right, so like that you're doing a video, right? So you have to give my couple of minutes, right? We can say hi, <laughs> Okay, all right, so um, method of identifying hazards, you have, um, I just mentioned this, you have um, previous risk assessments, jobs, job safety analysis, safe systems of work, workplace inspections, analysis of job instructions, daily safety tours, past accidents, incident data. So these are different ways of identifying hazards. I mean, there are simpler ones, I believe. Of course, there are some simple ones here as well, like the inspection and the tour one. Um, you know, maybe the 
MSDS sheets is their complete results and audits. And so you can have a look at these. And these are all ways of identifying hazards, right? Um, who are some of the persons that could be at risk? Um, I guess I have to get any reason, right? So what are the people that could be at risk? Uh, you can have here. Um, I guess that this one though is typically just three marks if they were to ask who are the persons that could be at risk. Uh, it could really be anybody. Um, I mean, we have here yeah, public visitors, contractors, trespassers, but they do like three for exam. And the three that they like is the latter three that you see in here, right? So um, who could be the persons that could be at risk? You have uh, young persons, disabled persons, new and expectant mothers. Those are the three that they like for your exam, right? Um, this again right so um we mentioned this before just about 20 minutes into the lesson there um hopefully i, I don't know if it would have been more than that um evaluate the risk to determine or decide if it's adequate or not we mentioned there about three ways of determining uh, determining the risk qualitative using words high medium or low semi-quantitative using the form line that you have the number but the number have a meaning. For example, one means low, five means high. And then you have the semi-quantitative, sorry, the quantitative way that is more or less used for those diploma students. So let me just try to finish this off and I would, um, I would go into the past paper. So if you're using the formula, the formula is likelihood by um, you know, severity. Likelihood could range from one to five and that one means um, extremely improbable. Five means near certainty consequences or the severity here one is minimal but five would be things like death catastrophic right so you put this together um you know you end up with what okay like a range and i mean you put it together like five by five is 25 so the highest you get to be 25 and then you can judge what happens from that for example if you get you know a low risk assessment let's say three three will fall between the range of one to four meaning that the risk is acceptable if you get 20 20 is going to fall between this range, 70 to 25, which is unacceptable. Now, we didn't create this range, you see, it. this is actually from the HSE, but you get the idea, I guess, the higher you come or the closer you come to 25, the 25 is the highest you'll ever be, 5 by 5 is 25. The, the closer to 25 you are, it would be unacceptable. Um, the lower numbers will be acceptable, of course, right? So um, I did have one here, if I can go to this example. Electric kettle overheating due to failure of the thermostat. The formula is likelihood by consequences. The likelihood being five, meaning it's very likely that the electric kettle will overheat. The severity being four. Um, five by four will give you 20. Now again, 20 is unacceptable, right? Once the risk assessment is unacceptable, what you have to do is put further controls in place. Remember that's the purpose of it, identify preventative and protective measures by first getting the risk. But once the risk is unacceptable, you put further measures in place. And then what, do, what those further measures will do, for example, regular maintenance, something called PAT testing, something from the UK. PAT here stands for portable appliance tool testing. Frequent inspection, the risk will go down. Two by three will give you six. And six is much better than 20. So it seemed, it seemed to be acceptable now anyway, right? Now, whenever you do reduce the risk, you get something called um, the residual risk. The residual risk is the risk that remains, right? So remaining risk after further precautions or controls have been implemented, it must be acceptable in terms of legal requirement. Acceptability can be decided on the tolerability of the risk. A risk can be tolerable but unacceptable by some. That may be something to discuss in another lesson, right? So I'll stop there. Um, this is a uh, an overall view of what a risk assessment will look like. Now, this is the same five steps, right? Uh, most people who do risk assessments, they know it is actually a spreadsheet, right? Um, so this is just a look at it on a spread anyway. So you normally know, have um, an activity taking place, let's say manual handling, and then from there you go to step one, which is identify the hazards, pinch points, cuts, trappings, right? Um, you could go into maybe who is affected, people in the vicinity, the workers, the young person, the pregnant employee, what is the existing risk controls, uh, proper supervision, permit to work, 
what is the uh, what is the initial risk? The initial risk will be the risk with those controls in place. So we said five of five, the likelihood very high for somebody getting a you know trap. Severity being four, five by four is 20. Again, 20 is unacceptable. So you want to put further controls in place. You put further controls in place. I would have just mentioned something very simple here. Regular monitoring. And then the risk will go down. Well, I mean, this is just, um, this is really just theoretical. In, in, in real life, regular monitoring doesn't really do anything. But the idea here is that when you put a further control in place, the risk number will go down. So then three by two will give you six, right? And that is a basic idea of it anyway. Let me just um, try to see if we can get that past it by here for you all, right? So there was one um, that is actually not it, right? There was one. Um, of course, I mean, the risk assessments are typically on every um, past paper, right? So let me try to close this off here and end this show. Right, um, the slide showed out is anyway, and I say initial, right? Um, yeah, risk assessment is a part of every past paper, right? So, um, whichever one you have, right, um, you can look through your questions and you should be able um, to get, right? Um, a past paper, I seem to have probably hidden it well behind the screen, right? Uh, let me see if I can probably bring up something here. Um, right, so the one I have here, hopefully it comes up. All right. Um, Right, so this is um, 2017, right? Um, let me see if I get back into the share screen button. If not, um, if not, I guess I'll just minimize it. Let me see share screen, right? Yeah. Right, yeah, so this is, um. 2017, um, uh, one of the older years anyway, I mean, not too old for us anyway, right? Um, but like I said, I mean, typically I did see in the back of your textbook, I'm not saying the back, the back of the chapter, I, I know for sure the first class in our book has um, really good questions in it anyway, right? But I did see to this one now, uh, this textbook as well, that there are questions um, at the end of the chapter, right? Um, I'm, I'm not too sure if they are passive questions, but they didn't really look like actual passive questions. They look as if the author made them up anyway, right? Um, so I, I just opened this at random, just to be honest with you, just before the recording, uh, because it is like a golden rule, though, that, um, you know, every chapter has to be tested, so there would be a question on chapter one and maybe more question on chapter one. Uh, chapter one is kind of big anyway, right? And um, questions on chapter two and three, et cetera, right? So likewise with that thought in mind, um, you know, uh, there would also be questions on risk assessment as well, right? So this one um, says, Give the meaning of the term risk and give a workplace example, right? So um, just just so that you'll get this again, please, um, you know, if you're going to give this a try, listen to what I'm going to tell you, that, um, that uh, to get the meaning of the term risk, right? Of course, the meaning of the term risk is what you saw on this slide. Um, the likelihood of harm occurring together with the severity but the example is kind of difficult to get, right? The, the example, why I said difficult is because, is because the example, um, most people go and they put the hazard as the example, right? If you see something like fall from height, that is actually not an example of the term risk, right? Um, fall from height, 
is really the, this really the hazard, right? Remember we said risk is really going to be judged by saying high, medium, or low. So see if we can get this, right? To, to give the example of um, to give the example of risk, you first have to give a hazard, right? So we can probably do it in the corner here. You can say, okay, the hazard is going to be, um, let's say the hazard is going to be fall um, from height, right? So if the hazard is fall, you cannot go back and say that the risk is also fall. Remember, risk is now, risk is really when you find like the number there, how likely is it somebody will fall together with what will be the consequence? All of this is part of the answer. To give the example of risk, you have to say the hazard is fall from height. And the risk is how likely the person could fall together with the severity. So you have to almost make up a calculation there. You have to say that, that you know, that maybe the chance of a worker falling off a scalp, a scalp is three. And the severity of the fall from a scarf, well, that's going to be kind of bad anyway. And the boost you can get is 5, so then 3 by 5 is 15. So therefore, this isn't quite 25, but 15 is still high in the scale. And if you see these are written, scale from 1 to 25, right? Ah, uh, so maybe you have the ink there, right? <laughs> if it's, um, I'm not sure why it's not working, right? If you say, if, if you say it's, um, it's, it's 1 to 25, right? Then, um, then, then the um, then 15 is still in the, somewhere just above the past the middle line. Then, so then you can see the risk is going to be medium, and then that will be the example that they are looking for. In fact, this then all of this calculation here is the example that they're looking for. It's not as simple as saying the example of a hazard is like um, a piece of cloth on the ground or oil on the ground, that is not the answer, right? Identify groups who may be a population at risk from a work activity when we mention this, the groups. The groups could be young persons, the groups could be, you know, um, persons who are differently abled, etc. cetera. Um, let's see if we can get a mark for that. That is just about three marks, and then three groups of persons there that could be um, a population at risk, right? Um, part C, I would like why it is important to consider the population at risk when carrying out a risk assessment. Well, I just said it, right? Remember, this is all about suitable and sufficient. If we know that the population at risk is pregnant employees, it means then the likelihood of harm is going to be more, right? If we know the population at risk is persons who are differently abled, the severity is going to be more or even young persons. So the population at risk do indeed affect the outcome of your risk assessment. So why it is important to consider the population at risk is that the population affects the risk numbers, right? So let's see what they had here, and I'll close this off. Um, so for part A, um, for part A, many candidates were able to identify that risk involves the likelihood of the syllabus contention of the meaning of the term hazards and risk assessment. However, only around half of candidates were able to be high level risk. As I mentioned, for the two times, it's just the hazard, but risk is the quantity then the hazard being realized. Right? Some candidates give an example of a hazard electrical cable without explaining the risk. So the example is the hazard of the risk, right? Again, just maybe to, to say that all over again that um for, for this to be a risk, what you have to say is that, you know, um, there may be a, a narrow walkway. It may be in the dark, may be poorly lit. So therefore, the risk of tripping over an electrical cable is therefore going to be high. And then, or you can give it in terms of the numbers, you can say 4 by 5, 20, or 5 by 5, 25, etc. right? Um, part B, which is the part with the groups of persons, um, you know, who may be a population at risk. Just on view. So uh, many candidates recognize that the groups went too far again, right? So went too far again. Right. Many candidates recognized 
that the group within the population are different risk and therefore require different control measures to protect them. Few candidates appreciated that it is a legal requirement to consider certain populations such as but new or expectant mothers, and we did cover this today. Some candidates misinterpreted the question on outlined reasons why special case workers were at risk rather than what the question asked for. Other candidates opted to outline why risk assessments were necessary or discuss risk assessments methodology, which is the five steps, and gain few marks because all they asked here really for was, you know, to identify, you know, the populations at risk. So then you can go with new expectant mothers, you can go with disabled persons, you can go with young persons. That would have been for, there was no need to explain nothing here really. It was really, if you look at it, it was really an identify question, right? So why, why um, is it important to consider the population at risk as if it wasn't obvious enough already? Um, where is the answer for that part, right? This, I guess they didn't talk much about that there. Or maybe they did in part C there, right? This sitting highlighted that some candidates do not know the difference between hazards and risks, right? And again, if you want to take those kind of um, or the whole or how skip right? The risk really are numerical on the hazard, right? Um, being realized. And this is high, medium, or low, right? Um, so blah blah blah. As such, course providers should help to ensure that they understand this topic more thoroughly, right? Well, it, it's there, it's it's in your book. It couldn't get it more straightforward than this, right? I would probably um, do another one because remember the lesson isn't completed. We are up to step three. We have step four and step five to go. We have done how to identify the hazard. We have done who could be at harm, and we have done evaluate the risk and decide on the precautions. Typically, if this is 15, you'll have to put in further precautions to drop the numbers down. So I guess if I start the other one, um, I would, you know, do a, a risk assessment for you all anyway, right? So um, let me see how I could um, stop this software, right? Um, so stop the video, right? So I would see you all um, with a, another lesson. Um, most of the work that you all have is in your um, textbook. The textbook is a good source of information, right? Um, look at it. It's a nice read. Both books, you know, I, of course, you know, I prefer the older book anyway. And that's because that's the one I studied from, right? So this is the newer book, right? But quite, quite often, though, both books have the same information, just different pages, same regulations, three of the management regs, same step five, four, five steps, you know, INZG 163, right? So I'll see you all back at the end of this one. I'm just trying to figure out how to stop the, um, the presentation, right? So if you hear me, still blah, blah, in a way.